Thanks to our friends at The Motley Fool for sponsoring this video. Visit fool.com forward slash rive to receive the top 10 stocks to buy right now. One of the companies on the market that I think has a really interesting risk reward profile is Virgin Galactic. Now this is a very speculative stock. I wanna say that up front, but I think it's worth digging into and thinking about where it might be good to have an entry position into the stock. So to do that, I asked John Quas to join me from Working Capital JQ. John, how are you doing today? Doing very well. This is a company that fascinates me. I love outer space. I really like how they present their business. It's very flashy. And it's something that is really fun to get the kids involved as well. Perhaps yes. showing them a video on YouTube of the space flights and all that. So it's a fun company. Absolutely. This is one that my son owns and we watched when Richard Branson went into space. You could see that live. And that was a fun experience to say, hey, you own a little tiny piece of this company. I think it was three at the time. He didn't really understand what was going on, <laughs> but but that's how you get kids started investing. I'm Travis Hoyam from Rive Investing. Please subscribe here on YouTube to get all of my content. And I will put a link in the show notes to John's channel on Working Capital JQ. John, let's start with what Virgin Galactic does. I'll just kind of give a brief over here, overview here and you can add to it. This is really a space tourism company. It, that's not something that people necessarily like to say, but that is the way that they're building their business. People are going to pay between two hundred fifty and four hundred fifty thousand dollars per ticket for what is going to be a two to three day experience, culminating in a couple of minutes in space. So what they've done is over the last couple of decades designed a mothership, which is then going to attach a spacecraft, and that's where four to six people are going to go up into space for this experience. So very, a very unique product. There is only one other company, Blue Origin, that's really competing with them. I'll get into the technology differences and why, you know, I think this is a maybe a better way to go long term. But anything you wanted to add there on just generally what they're building? I think that you hit the nail on the head. The primary goal of the company, at least in these early phases of the business, is space tourism, like you said, and building out that spaceport facility that they have in New Mexico, a very aesthetically pleasing building. It's very much about the experience, a destination. They're talking about building more internationally as well, but this is, like you said, it's a luxury tourism product. Yeah, and they do have some things potentially in the pipeline, like a Mach 3 aircraft that could be like a really high-end, really fast private jet is the way that I like to think about it. But that's they got to execute on getting people into space on a regular basis before we even think about that. So there are some other things potentially in the pipeline, but not something we're going to talk a lot about here today. I want to start with the differentiation that they have on how they built their product. The aircraft and the spacecraft that Virgin Galactic has take off and land horizontally. So just like an airplane, you're going to take off from a runway, in this case in New Mexico, where they have their first spaceport, which is what they're calling them. The way to think about that long term is that I think it makes it more repeatable, meaning they could potentially do one or two of these space flights every day from that spaceport. And it makes it more economical or it should make it more economical. We'll see how the numbers play out long term, but it's just more fuel efficient from a rocket fuel standpoint to take off horizontally and then go up. They eventually drop the two, spacecraft one, and release. then it rockets into space. So there's kind of two stages there, fire, fire. but it's very different than something like Blue Origin, which is Jeff Bezos's company, which is taking off like rockets have always taken off from a place like Cape Canaveral. Very different in, in both the experience and then I think the cost structure. That's one reason that I think that this could potentially be a company that's built to last more in the space tourism business. We haven't yet to see them actually prove that out. But what are your thoughts on just generally the design? Because I think they really thought about this much more from an experiential standpoint. How would a larger market, we're not talking about millions of people going up to space, but we're thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of people eventually going to space. What are they going to want to do? Are they going to want to strap themselves into a rocket or is something that's a little bit more familiar, like an aircraft going to be more accessible? You know, I think that's kind of the way that I think about this. Yeah, I think that's a good way to think about it. But to your point, forget about the guest experience, although that is very important. 
But the repeatability is the big aspect here. If you are going to build something that is sustainable, you do have to have a system that these crafts are being used on a regular basis mm -hmm. and your facility is able to handle volume. And to your point, I believe that Virgin Galactic has envisioned a system where those two things are very possible. I believe that their facility, from what I was looking at in my notes, hoping for once a month, they can handle a flight right now. Early on, I think that's right. Let's get into a presentation that they gave when they came public via SPAC. So this presentation goes back to 2019. So the numbers are a little bit older, but it is a very forward-looking document and they don't update these and give the same kind of forward-looking information. They haven't done that recently in part because they've had so many problems with their reliability and actually getting off the ground, which we'll cover in just a second. But if you think about the way that they're positioning their business, they built this spaceport, Spaceport America is what they're calling it. And this is really just a purpose built facility for exactly what they're doing. And here you can see, this is their first, their VSS Unity. This is one of the more modern generations of the spacecraft itself. That's what's actually going into space. And then this is the mothership is what they call it. So the spaceship would actually attach right here in the middle. The One of the ways that they were selling it at that time is that this is such a unique experience. And this is something that I still think about today is you go, oh my gosh, who would want to pay $400,000 for a couple of minutes in space? And the answer is probably a fair number of people. I mean, there are a lot of billionaires. There are a lot of hundred millionaires, tens of millionaires. There are under a thousand people who have ever been to space. So to count yourself among them is a really valuable experience. And if we get to the point where we know it's safe and it's repeatable and it's something that you can do and just pay a lot of money for, that's a really cool experience to do once in a lifetime. Here's another way to look at this as well. High net wealth individuals value experiences. Renting a yacht costs $500,000 a week. Not exactly an uncommon thing in the high wealth community. Not something John and I have done yet, but same thing with a private island. You're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars and even hotel rooms can cost tens of thousands of dollars. So don't be surprised or don't be scared off by that big sticker number for, for a ticket. So here's where they get into some of the projections of what they're looking to do with the business. Now, again, this was put together in 2019. So they thought at that time that 66 cumulative passengers would have flown in 2020. We are now in 2023 and the total commercial passengers is still zero, but they are looking to ramp pretty quickly. Passengers flown, they think, 1500. So that would be what three, four, five flights a day from a single spaceport. And they have talked about it being possible eventually to generate a billion dollars in revenue from the spaceport. Now, actually, since then, they have raised their ticket prices by about double. So that's an interesting anecdote that to generate the same amount of revenue, they wouldn't necessarily have to do the same number of flights. And then this is the, again, a little bit older, but single flight unit economics, $1.3 million in revenue. And then the contribution margin, which is basically the margin from each flight would be about $800,000. Now the next generation spacecraft is going to be six passengers. And like I said, those ticket prices are now more like 400,000 to 500, $450,000. So this revenue number could be in excess of $2 million, two to $3 million per flight. So the economics could theoretically be really good as they ramp up the business. I think that's what I think about it. This is, all, this is entirely a company where you're looking at what is the potential upside. And I think it's really pretty high. If they get the business off the ground, they are looking to launch their commercial operations in the second quarter of 2023. We're now actually moving to the point where they have kind of put a stake in the ground there. They've done this a couple of times before and not hit these marks, had major delays where they've upgraded their mothership. And then they've been upgrading the spacecraft as well. I think the most recent delay was really mothership related, but that's the upside here. John, anything you want to add to the upside potential and what you think about there before we get into what we're actually paying for the business today? You look at the numbers that you just showed. I think that they're very helpful and frankly, crucial if you are investing in Virgin Galactic, you do need to understand the per flight economics. And so mm -hmm. potentially with the raised ticket prices, increased passengers, 
maybe you're looking at a million dollars in contribution profit per flight. Yeah. That's an important number to know, especially if they can ramp up to maybe not a flight per day, but what about 300 flights a year? Now you're talking about 300 million in contribution profit. Contribution profit doesn't account for everything that they are going to have expenses in the business, but it does kind of give you a ballpark thought of what we're talking about here. And then if longer term, I know we don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but if you can open up additional spaceports that mm -hmm. are also doing similar numbers, it does increase exponentially. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Let's talk a little bit about what the business is trading for, what, what we can buy the business for today, and then what their opportunities are. Market cap, as we're recording, $1.5 billion. The other thing that I want to note is that there is $1.1 billion of cash on the balance sheet and no debt as of the end of the third quarter of 2023. They will be reporting earnings on February 28th, 2023. So we'll get an update on that number. And they're burning a little over $100 million per quarter on the business, on R&D, on capital expenditures, on, on things like that. So you could make the argument that this is a value because they have about 80% of their value in their stock in cash on the balance sheet, but they are burning through that pretty quickly. So I think those are interesting to note as we get to the upside potential. One thing I do want to note it, one thing I do want to note here, Travis, just because I was reading some of your comments from a previous video, somebody chimed in and said they don't have that much cash on the balance sheet. Technically true. It, we're talking about cash equivalents and marketable securities. And so over, I believe it's 600 million in marketable securities. That is a very secure form of money for the company. So what you are saying here in the aggregate, 1.1 billion is accurate. Just wanted to clarify that for anyone in the comments who was wondering. Yeah, and what companies often do is that buy things like treasuries, which isn't technically cash. It's a marketable security, but they have to market as marketable security. But on a press release like this, they're calling it a cash equivalent. The upside for this company, we already talked about a little bit, but we're getting to the point now where commercial operations are supposed to start in Q2 2023. Like you said, they will ramp relatively slowly, but what are you looking for there as you think about the upside, because I think we, we talked about the downside risk is literally zero. This is a company that could potentially not get off the ground literally and go bankrupt as a result. Maybe there would be some extra cash eventually that somebody would want to buy like a Boeing or a competitor or something like that. They do have partners who are helping them build their spacecrafts. But I do think the risk is the ultimate risk that this is a company that returns absolutely nothing to shareholders. But from an upside perspective, I think we're paying much less for this business than we were a year or two years ago, which makes that risk reward profile that much more attractive. So what are you looking for next quarter or the next year or two to think, hey, maybe this is a company that I should be adding to my portfolio. First and foremost, and I know it's going to sound obvious, but they have got to get these flights off the ground. They have got to start commercial tourism at some point, because at this point, going back to 2019, they've been talking about it. And I realized that the pandemic was in there and it threw a monkey wrench in their timing. At the same time, we're in 2023 now. We have to get going at some point if we're ever going to have hope that it's actually going to be viable at scale. So that is what I am looking for in 2023. This has got to get going. And I'm also looking, this is a company because of the nature of the business, its margin for error is literally zero. You cannot have an accident on a space tourism flight. I really want to see those processes. How fast can they go over the spacecrafts after a flight? Can they go through their checks? How firm are their protocols and their checks and everything? You want to see them be thorough, but you also want to see them be as fast as possible, but no faster, because you need to get this thing going repeatedly at the same time your margin for error is zero. That's a little bit harder to judge yeah. from a outsider perspective, but I think... If they can start whittling it down to, hey, we're getting ready on a monthly basis, I think that's a good sign in 2023. Yeah, and I'll just note, I've written a couple of times about their history of these delays. And 
my interpretation, again, we're doing this, we're saying this from the outside. We don't know what the conversations are internally to the company, but they seem to be putting safety over speed. And I appreciate that. This is a stock that I do own shares in. And I don't want to have an accident because that's the absolute worst thing that could happen. I would much rather that you delay commercial oper operations for a year to make sure that safety number goes up to as close to 100% as it possibly can be. So yes, that is absolutely something to think about, but it does seem like the delays that have happened over the last two years specifically have really been because they wanted to increase safety and increase that turnaround time. So we'll see the rubber is going to hit the road in the next few months. And we've got to see commercial operations get off the ground. I'm intrigued by the risk reward profile. I have called this a 0x or 100x stock because I think either my son who's five years old is going to, it's just going to be normal when he's 15 or 20 to have people going into space on a day-to-day -day basis, just for tourism sake, maybe even mock speed travel is going to be more common than it is today. And we just won't think about it. It won't be a thing. And a company like Virgin Galactic is going to be the one facilitating that, but the downside risk is zero. So I think that's worth acknowledging with anybody looking into the stock. Any final words there, John? I'll say, Travis, that what you just said there about the point-to-point -point travel and the mock, I believe it's, what is it? I forget what mock it is, but it's really fast. That travel, that is, to me, the more compelling investment opportunity. It reminds me of Tesla in a way. So you start oh, off with this luxury product, right? The high-end Roadster. And that is only for a certain demographic. Not everyone is buying that first Tesla. But that is what is giving you the resources and the scale to all of a sudden come out with something that is viable for the vast majority of the population. And I think that is the long-term Virgin Galactic. And when I say long-term, I'm talking the 20-year thesis on yeah. Virgin Galactic is get this space tourism going and then get it going at scale. But once you've done that, then you can start having this point-to-point -point travel. They talked about L.A. to Tokyo potentially in two hours. Yes, that is going to be very expensive, but guess what? There are a lot of business people who would pay to get from those two places in two hours as opposed to riding commercial airlines. And that becomes all of a sudden a much more mass adoption product that who's going to be able to do that? Who's going to have the infrastructure in place to do something like that? I don't think anyone else will. Certainly not Blue Origin, not with what they're building with the vertical liftoff. Certainly not a regular airport. Is that going to be able to facilitate a plane of that kind? I don't think. So who is in the in that spot? It's Virgin Galactic with their spaceports. And so I really think that is the more compelling long-term thesis. A lot has to play out for them to be able to start doing that. But if it's going to be a 100x stock, I believe that is part of the equation. I've never thought of that analogy, but I like it. Virgin Galactic is the next Tesla. We'll see if John's <laughs> we'll see if John's prediction comes true. I'd love to hear your comments about Virgin Galactic and what your thoughts are on the risk reward profile, what you're looking for over the next year or so. Follow Rive Investing here on YouTube and follow John's channel. I'll put a link in the show notes, but it's a working capital JQ. He's got some great content there. Thanks for watching and I'll see you here next time.